Hello everyone, it's Charlie Westeros here and I am finally back with my Game of Thrones episode reviews. It's been a long while since I've been anticipating the start of season four for Game of Thrones and I'm really happy to be back doing these episode reviews. As always, my episode reviews are spoiler free, but um, of course, if you do want to see my spoiler friendly reviews, I will be making some with a few other YouTubers, including James Johnson, and uh, they will be posted at his channel, and I will post a link to his channel in the comments below, as well as a link to that video when we finally get around to doing our review for this first episode. But until then, you may enjoy my spoiler-free videos right here. Of course, these ones are show viewer friendly, so I would appreciate if we avoided, you know, revealing too much in the comment section, as uh, well as... I will be trying to avoid spoiling anything in my video commentary. Um, also, I will be breaking down my episodes, or at least this one anyway, uh, by location. So I will start by discussing the events at King's Landing, then the events going on in the north, and then the Riverlands, and then the events across the Narrow Sea where Daenerys is. Um, of course, by all means, if you think I should change the format of my videos, Please let me know. I am always open to criticism, suggestions, you know, anything to make my videos more comprehensible, more interactive, whatever you guys think. And of course, don't hesitate to subscribe or like this video if you enjoy it. So without further ado, I will get right into discussing Season 4, Episode 1 of Game of Thrones, entitled Two Swords. So the episode starts off in King's Landing, and uh, the first thing we see is Tywin Lannister with Ned Stark's old Valyrian sword, Ice, and he is basically melting it down to forge two new swords. Immediately after that, we see Tywin Lannister giving one of them to his oldest son, Jaime, who is also the, or is now the new Lord Commander of the Knights, of the Kingsguard, sorry. And um, he is hopeful that his son will get to learn how to use this sword with his only one working hand. I think it's his left hand, actually. That's the only one working one. Anyway, Tywin also tells Jamie that he wants him to leave the Kingsguard and to, you know, go to Casterly Rock and rule the place in his stead while Tywin remains at King's Landing to help Joffrey rule the realm. Or at least rule for Joffrey, I would say. Um, almost right away, T Jamie is completely against the idea of leaving the Kingsguard. He wants to remain on it, and he doesn't want to give up his post. Now, of course, the underlying assumption that we get from that is that he wants to stay behind because of Cersei, and we later later on he does tell her this. However, we all know that he went through, I guess, a pseudo-baptismal scene in the last season with Brienne of Tarth, you know, when he was in that, um, the bath, and he was hallucinating. It's almost like we get this vibe that he's starting to reinvent himself, and I think as this episode progresses, we do get more and more of that vibe. Uh, so my hunch, and it's also something that he's hinted at as well in this in this part of the the episode, is that he also wants to remain on the King's Guard, I guess as a punishment for having broken so many oaths in the past, you know, such as killing Aerys Targaryen, and I think also possibly for his other wrongdoings, including maybe you know pushing Bran out of the window and killing his own cousins, even though I know he does not overtly state that. Um, even we actually see later on that Jaime wants. You know, he really wants Cersei, but I also do think there are mild hints here that he also is internally starting to move away from her somewhat, just somewhat, um, because in this first scene, he tells Tywin that he wants nor wife or, ch or children. At the same time, I do find him saying this as a little ironic since we already know that he has children from Cersei, and although it's not officially, you know, stated, he certainly is as close to Cersei, or at least he was as close to Cersei, as a husband should be. At the same time, I think we also are getting a slight sign of him losing interest in his wife and kids. You know, we have that slight friction scene between him and uh, Joffrey at one point, and then we have another scene where he's having friction with Cersei. So yeah, there's that whole dynamic at play between him choosing his role as as a member of, as you know, a lord, the, the commander of the King's Guard versus his role as Cersei's lover and the pseudo-uncle father to her children. Um, but before the scene ends, though, we do know that he does get he does get to keep one of the two Valyrian swords that his father gives him. 
but we are also left wondering what's going to happen to the other one. Now, personally, I feel that him receiving one of the Stark's uh, swords is pretty significant in that, you know, by carrying a piece of Ned Stark's ice, he is, at least symbolically, I think, possessing or holding a piece of the Stark's will in his hands. And I think this kind of gets reaffirmed later on when, you know, Brienne of Tarth reminds him of his promise to Catelyn Stark. But I will get to that shortly. So, moving it along, um, we then have a scene with Tyrion, who is waiting for Prince Doran Martell of Dorne to reach King's Landing. Uh, Prince Doran Martell is supposed to arrive to witness the wedding of Marjorie Tyrell and um, uh, Joffrey Lannister. Um, but we quickly find out that he is, in fact, not doing so well, so in his stead he sent his brother, uh, Prince Oberyn Martell the Viper, as he is also known, and Prince Oberyn apparently has already arrived in King's Landing that morning. So then we get a quick scene change uh, to Oberyn Martell himself at Littlefinger, or Peter Baelish's, brothel. And he's there with his paramour, what is called a paramour, which is basically a mistress-slash-wife type of role, um, where, you know, he's there with this woman named Ilaria Sand, since she's also a bastard, she possesses the last name Sand. But we also get the hint that these things don't seem to matter too much to Dornishman, clearly, since, you know, he has this sort of relationship and there doesn't seem to be any issues with it. At least she doesn't possess any issues with it, and see, he doesn't seem to either. At the same time, he also seems pretty open and flexible with his sexuality, which is, of course, you know, something I suspect from the show anyway, and going how they're going, how they're, and suspect from how they're going with this is that Dornishmen are pretty loose and carefree, if you will, in a good way, I will say. Um, so yeah, him and Ilaria Sand, his paramour, are at Littlefinger's brothel, and they're picking out a girl, um, a female prostitute, I know, you know, the one, I think it was the acrobatic one, the same one from last season that Podrick Payne received as a recompense or a gift from uh, Tyrion for having saved his life. And before um, before, you know, he gets down and dirty with her and his paramour, he also tells the uh, Littlefinger's pimp or prostitute, whatever his role is, to join in on the fun and, you know, that, uh, that he wants him to stay. So, I thought this was kind of interesting because there's a quote where Oberyn says to the, to the, um, the pimp slash prostitute, the male one, and he asks him if he's ever been with a prince before. Now, in the back of my mind, I was thinking back to the last season where I'm pretty sure it was the same character who hooked up with Loras Tyrell, um, which was kind of interesting because even though Loras Tyrell is not a prince, if, I think, you know, Loras Tyrell does possess some kind of status, obviously. So when Oberyn Martell, you know, says, oh, like, have you ever been with a prince before? It was almost like, in the back of my mind, a little jab towards, um, at least on the, on the part of the show director, producer, that's a little jab towards... Uh, Loras in a slight way because you know he was with L this prostitute was with Loras and now he's who's like you know an important lord but now he's with uh, Oberyn Martell who's you know a legit prince he's working his way up in the world I guess of of the escort services anyway moving along before um, we get too much action going on we get a quick interruption from these two Lannister men in the brothel who are humming the song, The Reigns of Castamere, and of course this pisses off Doran, uh, Oberyn Martell as we find out later on, or shortly thereafter. And he, before he, you know, before anything escalates too much, before Oberyn kills that Lannister soldier guy, uh, Tyrion walks in and, you know, starts to break up the tension and goes on a, goes for a walk with um, Oberyn Martell. We pretty, fa we pretty quickly find out that Oberyn Martell is in fact gone to King's Landing for for um, vengeance. You know, he's really angry because his sister, uh, Elia of Dorne, is in fact the wife, or in fact was the wife, of Rhaegar Targaryen, who, as we all know, was the son of the, of the last Targaryen king, Aerys Targaryen. Now, he is there because he wants vengeance for her death, since, according to the rumors and the stories, the mountain, i.e., Gregor Clegane, is supposed to have had, is supposed to have, you know, murdered her two kids with with Rhaegar, uh, the kids that she had with Rhaegar, that is, and then he took a, and supposedly he took a sword, raped her, and then he cut her in half. Now, before I get into talking about that, I thought the image of, uh, at least the image that was uh, presented in this scene, i.e., the idea that a sword cut her in half, is kind of symbolic in that it feeds back to the name of the episode, i.e., Two Swords. 
you know, in the beginning of the episode, we get one sword being cut into two. So it's the kind of image that's running throughout this episode, at least I feel. The idea of a sword being cut in two, the per a sword cutting people in two, so on and so forth. So just want to throw that out there at you guys. Anyway, moving along. So we know that Oberyn and Martell is, of course, there for vengeance. He is mad, and he also seems to blame Tywin Lannister, Tywin Lannister since Tywin, he presumes, would have known what the mountain would have done or was going to do um, to Elia of Dorne and her kids. Um, at the same time, I thought there was an another quick line, and I won't get into discussing this too much, but he also talks about how Rhaegar ran off with another woman and left Elia on her own, even though she was so madly in love with him. And I thought the word that Oberyn used, you know, I think it was he either ran off or he buggered off with another woman. It was interesting since, of course, we get we, we have the understanding that he is talking about Lyanna Stark, uh, Ned's sister. And, of course, in the first season, we always hear about how Lyanna Stark was abducted or taken away, you know. It was a very, we had this very idea of a forceful image of her being captured by Rhaegar and, you know, taken into captivity. Whereas Oberyn seems to present it, he seems to slightly hint at it anyway, as a more of a consensual thing. At least that's the vibe I'm getting. But, again, I'm not too sure. I won't get into that too much. I just thought that was kind of a neat transition between Oberyn, or neat comparison between the way Oberyn perceives that event and um, um, Robert Baratheon. Anyway, so we know that the Dornishmen are pretty pissed off about that. Um, before I end this discussion of this scene, I do find it was I do I did find it quite interesting that the Dornishmen had a different accent than the rest than the West. I cannot talk today, man. He, the Dornishmen have a different accent from the we, from the rest of the Westerosi. There we go. Uh, originally, I heard the accent in a few clips on YouTube from the previews for the season, and I wasn't too into them. However, I will say the accent kind of grew on me. Now I'm actually really liking it. It's it's a really strange accent. It almost sounds kind of Spanishy, but it's not. I don't know. I can't even describe it. it. It's a really good choice, though. I will say I've I've come around, and I think I really do like the Dornish accent at this point. And of course, on characters like Ilaria Sand and Oberyn Martell, such epic characters, especially Oberyn, I think I can I can accept it. So moving on, um, 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 um. We then have a scene, at least in terms of what takes place at King's Landing, a scene with Sansa Stark, who's refusing to eat. You know, she is depressed. She is upset because, of course, her whole freaking family is being killed off. Um, Shay's trying to get her to eat, and Ty um, Tyrion, her husband, as well. We also get a really strong sense that things aren't so well, aren't going so well between Tyrion and Shay. You know, she's trying to. After that scene, we have another scene where she's trying to, you know woo him, trying to get him to fool around, and he kind of, well, he's not buying into it. He's really not that interested. And, you know, they get a little fight. He's upset that she's coming into his room because, you know, he's worried for her safety, naturally. And um, she's irritated because she thinks he wants to, she, he wants to send her away to the, uh, to the free cities across the sea. So we get a little kerfuffle there, some arguments. You know, I, I think Shay's clearly jealous of Sansa, even though she has nothing to worry about, really. However, the biggest thing in this scene is that, of course, the handmaiden overhears uh, Shay and Tyrion, and now knows that Shay is, well, she is basically Ty Tyrion's mistress. And I, and I don't know if anybody of you caught this, but this is the same handmaiden in the last season who Shay basically prevents from going to run to tell Cersei about um, Sansa when she first had her period. And I think Shay actually last season held, held a knife to her throat, I think, if I remember correctly. So this is, I think, a little bit of a payback against Shay on the part of that spying maiden woman, whoever she is, servant. Because in the next scene, we then have Jaime, who's getting um, his golden hand fitted by Kyburn. Uh, now, Kyburn, if you might remember him, he was in the last season. He was the last. He was the only survivor at Harrenhal after, um, I believe, after after. Uh, Tywin ransacked the place. I forget who ransacked, who ransacked Iron Hall. What happened there? Yeah, that's right. Tywin, I think, killed off everybody and almost murdered everybody at, or all the no. Tywin murdered all the Stark soldiers and Stark forces at Harrenhal, except for Kyburn survived somehow. And now Kyburn's wound up at King's Landing, where he is um, getting creating a hand for Jaime Lannister. Um, I thought this was a pretty neat scene because, for one thing. Sh um, 
Cersei is expressing, you know, almost a trust, which is pretty rare for Cersei, because she doesn't seem to trust anybody, but she seems to quite like Kyburn, which is, you know, I think something to pay attention to for the future. Um, also, she mentioned she hates Maester Pacell, but I mean, who doesn't? He's kind of a creep. Also, he's a great actor, too, so I won't throw shit at the actor, because you're doing a great job. Um, but we also have, a, we also, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we have this scene where Jamie and Cersei are clearly having some issues in their relationship. Cersei's pissed off at Jamie for having been gone so long. They're not agreeing on his role. And she don't, almost seems to want him to leave King's Landing, which I thought was quite interesting. Because, you know, she wanted, him, she wanted him to come back for so long, and now, you know, she doesn't seem to want him that much now that he is back. Which is an interesting shift of the dynamic on, in terms of how they relate to each other. Uh, before the scene ends, however, we do have that handmaiden who was spying on Shay and Tyrion enter the room, and presumably she is going to inform Cersei of who Shay really is and how she is connected to Tyrion. So I think this is a definite sign that, you know, dangerous things are coming up for Shay, and I can only hope for the best for her because with Cersei in the know about Tyrion's personal business, it's not going to look good for her. At least that's my hunch. Moving along, after that scene, we get a quick scene in the gardens with Lady Olena Tyrell and Marjorie Tyrell, her granddaughter, her granddaughter, who are planning the royal wedding. I thought this was kind of a funny scene, and I really love Olena Tyrell because I like the way you know she was looking at all the jewelry and she commented on how, oh, my your grandfather gave me a necklace just like this one so many years ago when I was on my fiftieth name day when I turned fifty, and she just throws in the garden. I love that character. I think she's one of my favorites. And I've never actually truly acknowledged that when I think about it. But anyway, awesome actress, awesome character. That scene is quickly interrupted when we have Brienne come in the scene. And, you know, Brienne wants to express what truly happened when Renly was killed. And even though I know Marjorie to be, Marjorie to be a really calm and patient and, you know, loving person, I, I still was expecting her to be a bit more upset with um, Brienne of Tarth since, you know, presumably... Brienne was the one who, at least, is assumed by many to have killed Renly, even though it's not the case. And, you know, Brienne even informed Marjorie of this by telling her that it was that shadowy ghost figure of Stannis Baratheon who killed Renly. And, of course, we know that, but, you know, not everybody else does, clearly, except for Catelyn Stark, and she's dead. I thought this one was kind of interesting because, although it does show that Marjorie, you know, she's a very forgiving person. I also think it kind of hints at the fact that even though, you know, she lost the man who was supposed to be her first king, she doesn't seem that all that, all that heartbroken because she is going to get to be queen anyway. So at the end of the day, she isn't too disappointed. And I don't think it's totally because she is, you know, a forgiving person. Although I think with certain people, she is clearly. I think in this case, it's really, you know, an opportunistic thing that we're just not really overtly seeing because Marjorie is a very calculating and cautious and, you know, intelligent yet ambitious person. So it was a cute little scene nonetheless, and it was so strange watching those two characters walk in the garden together because they're so mismatched. You know, you have, you have, you have Brienne standing there like a freaking giant and almost walking in a very masculine way, whereas, you know, Marjorie almost looks like her wife. It was really, it was kind of cute in a way, I guess. Moving along, we then have... Uh, another scene in King's Landing where Brienne uh, discusses with Jaime his, his promise he made to Catelyn Stark in keeping the two Stark daughters safe. Now, this was a really cool scene because, well, for a few reasons. I guess the first one is that, you know, it shows that even though Jaime still has some of his old habits left, you know, he's kind of insulting towards Brienne, he's a bit dismissive. There were some signs, though, that he does clearly, or he is clearly still thinking about his promise to Catelyn. And he, you know, I think there are signs there, at least subtle signs, that he's going to potentially do something for uh, Sansa. And he also even brings up the fact that Arya Stark is missing and that she's probably dead. But it's in his mind somewhat, I think. Another thing is, is that he mentions to Brienne that after she chastises him for, you know, keeping his promise to Catelyn, he chastises her. He says, I think the quote was... Uh, where was it? Where was it? <laughs> oh, he says he asks if she if she is sure she's not a Lannister since she has the hair and the personality for it, but I guess doesn't have the looks for it. 
Now, of course, that's a little insult in his part, but at the same time, I kind of thought of it in a, in almost in like a romantic way, and here's why. You know, because Jamie practices incest, so for all you people who like to, you know, pair up Brienne and Jamie, and I guess I kind of, I could kind of see that. I like, I think I'd like to see them as a couple, probably. I think it was kind of funny considering it's kind of him saying, oh, you look like a Lannister, and I'm into incest, and you know, in the subconscious mind, maybe not his subconscious mind, but in the back of our minds, at least some of us, at least that's what I picked up, is that, oh, you look like a Lannister, you know, maybe there's a chance for us, you know, I'm into incest, if you get the joke. At least that's what I thought. Um, I also, I will say this about Brienne and Jamie's scene, I also thought it was really brazen of Brienne to tell Jamie that she should take Sansa out of King's Landing. And that's pretty, pretty intense considering, you know, she's married to Tyrion and him taking her out of King's Landing would be not the smartest move on his part in order to keep his sister, and especially his father and his son-nephew, the king, content, considering that would, you know, bring Sansa potentially away from where she is supposed to stay, or at least where they want her to stay, considering, you know, that could potentially bring up problems. So I thought it was kind of interesting how Brienne hinted at that to Jamie, and he did not necessarily defend his parents, his, his father's position, you know? He seemed, even though he wasn't in favor of it, he didn't exactly go and call around and say, oh, I'm gonna lock you up for having said that. So again, I think this hints at Jamie's shifting loyalties in uh, at least his his loyalties kind of shifting a little bit uh, for this season. So before the end of the King's Landing part of the episode, we then have uh, Sansa Stark walking in the Godswood and she is confronted by Dantos Hollard, you know, the same night she saved in the previous season from uh, being killed by by Joffrey on his name day because it's supposed to be bad luck to kill someone on your name day or birthday. Kind of like, I guess, how it's bad luck to kill your own guests when you invite them in your house, i.e. the Red Wedding. But anyway, I thought that was kind of a cute little scene with Dantos and Sansa. And I thought it was kind of funny because, you know, Sansa always talks about her knight in shining armor coming and saving her. She's a very romantic type. She wants her prince charming. And it was kind of sweet because the way she looked at Dantos was almost, you know, thankful in a way because he gave her a necklace, and even though he's a drunk, and he's not the greatest looking guy in the land, it's kind of an interesting twist to Sansa getting her Prince Charming, I guess, in a weird way. So I thought that scene was kind of cute. I didn't have much else to say about that other than that, but I'm hoping, you know, that we're gonna get to see more of the interactions between, or more interactions between Dantos and Sansa, because that girl really needs a break right now. She's had the worst luck in the past three and now four seasons, so who knows if uh, anything good will come of that. So that concludes everything that takes place in King's Landing. Now we'll move on to events in the North. So in the North, we have a couple of scenes here. Um, one takes place with Ygritte and Tormund Giantsbane, and they're kind of awaiting orders from Mance Raider as to what they should do next. Um, and all of a sudden, when they're, you know, sitting around talking about Jon Snow's betrayal and how um, Tormund's accusing Egret of having let Jon Snow escape because clearly she still has feelings for him, we get these really, really weird and creepy uh, wildlings show up. And honestly, they kind of reminded me of, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, the Borgs from Star Trek, you know? They're bald, they're kind of really white-faced, they have no emotions, they're very, they're not really robotic in their movements, but they're very meticulous and it's very like, you know, bam, bam, bam. Not much feeling there. I really got a Borg vibe from them, so, you know, check out a picture of the Borg if you want to agree or disagree with me on that one. Anyway, so these Borg, I mean, Fens, as they're called, show up. Um, we find out that they are cannibals and they're clearly people we don't want to mess with and you know, they have, they're eating a hand of a member of the Night's Watch, apparently, so, yeah. Not much else to say about them, but I do think that <laughs> the men of the Night's Watch are going to want to look out for these guys, because I think after the Giants, they're definitely the most frightening people north of the Wall who are coming south. Um, and then, of course, we have a scene at Castle Black with Jon Snow. He's finally woken up, um, and almost as soon as he's woken up, he has to go stand at a, a tr pseudo-trial, I guess, before a few members of the Night's Watch, including Sir Alistair Thorne, uh, Sir Jano Slint, who was previously a member of the of the Kingsguard, and who Tyrion dismissed. Um, I think it was in the second season, so he is back, but now he's at the Night's Watch. And I actually like that little jab that Jon Snow gave at him, 
when he when Janos then states that he was a member of the King's Guard, and then Jon Snow basically says, "Oh, well, you must have not been really good at your job if you're up here, dude." Well, it's kind of right, I guess, in that one. And of course, lastly, Maester Aemon, my favorite of the four on the trial council. Um, so yeah, Jon Snow does admit to killing Corrin Halfhand, and he doesn't even admit to sleeping with Yeager, which should be a, a punishable thing, a really, really severely, uh, a severe offense that should be punishable, punishable by death. But of course, Maester Aemon points out that, look at all the people who have been, you know, the members of the Night's Watch who've gone and hooked up with prostitutes at the nearest village, so... We can't really we can't really execute him considering everybody else has been doing the same crime um, during this time. Uh, also, basically, Maester Aemon is the voice who lets Jon go free because you know Jon Snow tells them that hey, there's more important things at hand right now, such as a freaking huge army of wildlings approaching from the north, and also some wildlings approaching from the south who want to kind of attack the the um, attack Castle Black from the south and from the North at the same time to kind of catch them off guard. Um, of course, the North is defended by the Wall, but the southern part of Castle Black does not have any uh, fortifications, which leaves Castle Black to be a bit defenseless on the southern side. So it's definitely going to be an issue for them if they want to make sure they survive any attacks on them from the Wildlings. One final thing I actually wanted to add about the discussion that things taking place in the North is that um, I thought it interesting when Maester Aemon told the rest of his fellow um, Men of the Night's Watch who were putting Jon Snow on trial is that he knew Jon Snow was telling the truth. And when he was asked how he knew Jon Snow was telling the truth, he replied by stating that he, used, he grew up in King's Landing. And I thought this was a very, very clever line, not only because it hints at the fact that Maester Aemon used to be, you know, a very important person as a Targaryen, but also because it hints to the fact that people in King's Landing, just as they are right now in the series, they have always been uh, deceitful and they've always been, you know, spying, especially people at court. So I think this is a really, really strong indication that, you know, things almost 100 years ago when Maester Aemon was alive aren't so different now. Um, when it comes to, you know, the whispering, the lying, the conniving, the plotting to gain power. Always happening again and again and again every generation. So, moving it along, we'll now, I will now, I, I will now um, talk about events in the Riverlands. So, in the Riverlands we have Sander Clegane with Arya as a captive. And um, he is basically telling her that he intends to bring her to her aunt Lysa Tully, who lives in the Vale. And for those of you who don't remember, Lysa Tully was the uh, crazy woman from season one who is breastfeeding that almost fully grown child. And um, she seems to think that the Lannisters have are the ones who murdered her husband, John Aaron. Now, of course, she's not all there, so I don't know if it's the best idea for the Hound to bring Arya Stark to her. But, you know, he claims he wants a reward, even though I think there is, you know, the fact that he 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 wants to keep Arya safe to some degree. But um, if he does bring her to Liza Tully, I am a little concerned, considering, you know, she's not all that sane, and I do worry for Arya's safety if she, that's where she ends up. Either way, Arya and uh, Sandra Clegane happen upon an inn, and Arya also notices that Polliver, uh, i.e. the guy who took her and her friends to Harrenhal, is there and he has her the sword that she, the sword that she received from Jon Snow needle, and she also states to Sander that he is the one who killed Lomi. I thought this was really funny because when she tells uh, Sander that she kind of goes, "What's a Lomi?" and she answers, "Well, he was my friend." Uh, I will say that the Hound had a lot of great one-liners this season. Um, he also, I think, mentioned that people who name their swords are cunts, which was hilarious. I don't know, just the way he delivers his lines are epic. I love the actor. Um, the character's amazing. This definitely, definitely this uh, episode, especially the scenes in the Riverlands, were truly Sandor's and Arya's. They kind of stole the show this episode, I would say. Anyway, so basically Arya just runs into the inn before Sandor can stop her, and they get inside, and as they observe the innkeeper and his daughters kind of getting harassed and, and um, you know, insulted, eventually a fight breaks up because our, Sandor Clegane basically states that he's not supporting King, the King Joffrey, Tar Joffrey um, Baratheon. He says, fuck the King, 
that ultimately ends up in a fight, and Sandor, Sandor completely whoops everyone in that inn. And I think the best part of the scene is the fact that we finally get Arya receiving a little bit of payback. The way she stood over uh, Polliver with Needle and the way she reclaimed it and then delivered the exact same lines to Polliver as he did to her friend Lomi when she kills him were just so well delivered and the look in his eye when he realized who she was were just priceless. And uh, I'm really hoping that these that this occurrence is, you know, a sign of things for a sign of things to come. And I hope it's going to hint towards the fact that Arya, you know, she just might get vengeance. Because if anyone deserves vengeance, it's her and Sansa. And I'm really hoping that this um, happens for her. For the final location I want to address for episode one of season four is across the narrow sea, and of course this uh, takes place where Daenerys Targaryen is. The scene opens up with her and her dragons, and I love the part where she's petting Drogon on the head, and it was very cutesy, dog-like. But then the second you see the dragon kind of snap at her after he's fighting over some animal with the other dragons was a little frightening, to say the least. Um, I think this obviously hints that the dragons are getting a little too big for her own control, and clearly they're going to cause some problems, I think, for the future. But um, for now, anyway, we we notice that she's on the march to attack the next city that her forces seek to invade, which is Marine. And of course, they want to free the slaves there, just as they did in Yunkai and Astapor. Now, before she can leave, though, she has to go find um, Dario Naharis and Grey Worm. And apparently they are gambling over whether or not or over who gets to ride with her at the front of the train, I guess. Um, in the end, though, she punishes them both by riding at the back of the train because, well, they, well, back at the back of the, of the army, I suppose, train, whatever. Uh, she punishes them both because they made her wait. Um, also, in case some of you didn't really notice, the guy with the beard is Dario Naharis, and Dario Naharis is the same character from the last season who um, basically switched sides to fight for her and killed off killed the other two leaders of his sellsword company. So uh, basically, they changed the actors, and it's I don't really know why, and it's kind of annoying because my friends were watching the show, and they didn't really know who that guy was, and I had to explain to them that it's the same guy with the long hair from last season, same character, but the actors changed. And although the current actor is awesome, I really hate it when they do that because it's hard for a lot of people to keep up with the continuity of the show. And it, I don't know, it doesn't look the best. But either way, the new actor's great. I hope they stick with them and I'll end it at that. Because uh, after that little debacle, Dario tries to, I guess, woo Daenerys a little bit more. You know, he picks some flowers from the region and shows them to her and tries to smooth talk her. And, you know, she tries to play a little bit coy, a little, a little, you know, she's, she's not giving in too easy to him. But um, he also does that with a point, of course, and his point is that, you know, if you're going to try to control these lands, if you're trying to forge like an empire in this region, you really have to know the land, you have to know the people. Everybody in this region knows exactly what these flowers are, they know their uses, especially the slaves, and if you want to be the mother of the slaves, the dragons, mother of all those free people, or these people being freed, you really need to understand them in and out inside and out because you know it's easy to rule land but not really know it so i think dario did have a really good point in how he expressed it however before we can get into any more we we, we learn any more details about that whole opinion of dario's we get interrupted by um the discovery that the miranese the people of the next city that daenerys wants to invade have basically strung up 150 slaves i believe for 100 for 150 kilometers or miles um, from the point where Daenerys is all the way to the city. And it's kind of to show that Daenerys has to be wary, you know, that they're not messing around. They're ready to kick some butt. They're not afraid of her. They, knows what, they know what she's about. They know she wants to, you know, free slaves, and they're, not, they're clearly not about to do that. So Daenerys is very, very wary, or at least she should be, even though in her eyes we get, you know, we get the sense that she's really pissed off. There's fire in her eyes. She's ready to kick some butt. But... At the same time, I think we have to be careful because she might be entering a trap. I mean, they're clearly trying to bait her here. And uh, even though Jorah Mormont says, okay, well, don't worry about it. Or not Jorah Jor Jor Mormont, it was, it was Barristan Selmy, I believe, who says, don't worry, like, we're going to take down all these 
we're gonna send like a train up ahead to like to pull down the dead slave children so you won't have to see them. Daenerys says, no, I want to look at each one of their faces as I go, as I march to Marine. So I think, you know, this is a way for her to be hardened in her resolve, you know, to get herself pumped up to attack the next city. And I'm really hoping we'll get to see that in the next episode, but I, you know, we'll have to wait and see because I really would like to see how she's going to treat these people who've pretty much thrown an insult right in her face. So I look forward to that. Um... I don't think I have anything else I really need to say on that scene. Uh, I will say that this episode was a great start to the series, I think, or to the season anyway. It wasn't too, too over the top crazy, but you know, we got just enough action, just enough sex, just enough nudity, I guess, too. Just enough, a bit of, just enough of, you know, a lot of Game of Thronesy stuff to get us back in the rhythm of things. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna get some more action soon, maybe a battle. I really, really want to see the Sack of Marine. I'm hoping for a Sack of Marine anyway. I don't know what's gonna happen with that. I'm, um, hoping for some action soon, whether it's across the sea or in the north. Just want action. Just want violence, because it's Game of Thrones. Anyway, I think that's all for now. Um, overall, I think I give this episode, if I have to be really, really strict, 8 out of 10. Um, of course, I normally would just give it 10 out of 10, and I probably would anyway, but if I want to be fair and stern and all that good stuff, then maybe an 8 out of 10, yeah, I think that's about fair. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. Definitely hooked, as always, so I look forward to some cool stuff next week. Anyway, if you enjoyed my video, please don't hesitate to like and subscribe. And again, if you want to see my video or my uh, review that will contain spoilers, I will be doing it probably tomorrow evening. So I'm assuming it will be uploaded by Wednesday at some point. So um, that'll be in my co-YouTuber Game, so Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire reviewer, James Johnson. I'll post a link to his channel below in the information section and um, check it out when it comes up. So that's all for now, guys. I hope to do another review next week. And uh, yeah. That's all, so take care.